as you turn in your Bibles or you key it up on your phones or your iPads, whatever the unit you're using out there to find the Word of God. If we're all on one accord and we've got that located in our Word, can you just give me an amen? amen? We have the King James up on the screen so we can read it together. If you don't mind stretching your legs and standing with me, let's read this, this one verse together. We spend time from the King James. It says, Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. Let's read that again. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. As you take your seats. The simple title for my, for my time together is Because Jesus Lives. And I've got just three very brief life lessons I want to spend with you from this episode. Let me, let me read these. Um, as it opens up in that 20th chapter, it talks about on the first day how Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, verses 1 and 2. And, uh, uh, and seeing the stone removed, the text tells us. Uh, and seeing the body no longer in the, in the tomb, that she ran and went to Simon Peter and, as John likes to say, that other disciple whom Jesus loved, <laughs> and said to them, this, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Now, in verse 3, it says, Amplified, upon this Peter and the other disciple came out, and they went toward the tomb. And they came running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and arrived at the tomb first. And stooping down, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not enter. Then Simon Peter came up following him and went into the tomb and saw the linen clo clothes lying there. But the burial napkin or the kerchief, which had been around Jesus' head, was not lying with the other linen clothes but was still rolled up or wrapped around and around in a place by itself. Then the Amplified says, our key verse, then the other disciple who reached the tomb first went in too, and he saw and was convinced and believed. I, I want to, I actually want to borrow just a couple lines, uh, a couple statements I saw. I, I give credit to, to Dr. Jeremy. Dr. David Jeremiah, because uh, he, he really pierced my soul when I heard a message early in the week, and uh, he just dropped three little nuggets out of that message that the Lord led me to just want to dive into. So I, I want to make sure I recognize him just in case he's listening. <laughs> uh, the first life lesson is simply this. Because Jesus lives, failure is not fatal. Because Jesus lives, failure is not fatal. And immediately in my mind when I heard that it rolled back to that, uh, it rolled back to the Peter episode, I'm thinking, I'm wondering now, as they're running toward this tomb, they've just heard from Mary Magdalene, who's come down to the tomb, with, as one episode says, she was coming with spices to continue to, uh, to anoint the body. Uh, and, and she comes down there and she sees uh, she sees the stone uh, has been, uh, the, the Greek in this text is interesting. Uh, uh, we say the stone has been rolled away. The emphasis, on the, the emphasis on the Greek text is that the stone had literally been uprooted and placed someplace else. So, so it wasn't that there were people who came along and possibly rolled. It wasn't that Jesus got up and just rolled the stone, necessarily stone away. It wasn't neatly, it wasn't a, it wasn't a neat, it was like the stone had been lifted. Am I close, Mother Feature? The stone had been, li had been lifted up and just moved out of the way. The power of that is what you've heard before, is that it wasn't that the stone was moved away so that Jesus could then walk out. Uh, because the resurrection body had the ability, has the ability, had the ability to go through the stone. But that was so that they could look in. The stone had been rolled away. 
And as she gets excited about it and goes to Simon Peter, I'm, I'm beginning, I'm wondering to myself, now what, what are you thinking, Simon Peter, if, having gone through this episode where, where Jesus in earlier chapters has told you that uh, when, you, when you rose up and you said, now these other, these other brothers have, will turn their back on you, but I'm going to be with you through thick and thin. I will never leave you in the midst of, of your, your, Jesus tells them, I'm going, to, I'm going to Jerusalem, brethren. I'm going to Jerusalem. And the purpose for me to go to Jerusalem is that I will lay down my life for your sins and for the sins of mankind. But, but don't, don't, don't think the story ends right there because on the third day, I will rise again. And Peter says, but I'll never leave you. And he says to Peter, you remember we talked about this earlier. He says, now, now Satan has desired to sift you and shake you like, 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 like weed, but, but I prayed for you. And when you are converted, but when you are converted, failure is not fatal, Peter. When you are converted, then go in and, and, and strengthen the brethren. And he also tells him now, you know, before the cock crows, you're going to deny me three times. And, and in that powerful chapter back in John 18, verses 15 through 18, and in verses 25 through 27, you get a glimpse of what it's like when Peter faces the reality that Jesus has now been taken into custody illegally and is now in the process of going through this, being, being ushered, delivered over the pile and about to go through this scourging process for your sins and for mine. And when they begin to ask him, they look at him and say, now weren't you with that band of followers? I'm not the one. Someone else says, now I've seen you. You look familiar to me. I'm, I'm, I'm not that guy. Yeah. Third time they ask him, now you, surely. It's almost as if someone said, now I, I remember you. Weren't you the guy they've been talking about that walked on the water and then, you know, when you took your eyes off of Jesus, sank down? Weren't you that guy that the, the stories are going and circulating around the, the village all about how, 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 you, how, how Jesus lifted you up out of the sinking, sinking the, the waves and winds and the waves? Weren't you that guy, Peter? Because the storyline on you is that you are part of, you're not only a part of it, that you might be one of the ringleaders among this. I'm not that guy. And you begin to wonder to yourself when you, when you're, when you're doing the work that God has called you to do and you're facing life the way life has this tendency to come at you. And in the midst of that, the hardships begin to come, the difficulties begin to come. You begin to be challenged in your circumstances because all things are not running smooth like you'd love them to be able to do. Every now and then, the enemy drops a little, a little weakness or a little, a little insecurity into your heart or, or, or you begin to worry. The sin nature inside of us begins to worry about what could happen to us next and what could befall us next. And we look back over our journey and we realize we've fallen down a few times and we're still carrying the baggage of, of, of falling situations in our life. Am I talking to anybody? Yeah, help me, help me out. I just drove up into your neighborhood. And, 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 and in the midst of that, we have this tendency, and the Lord knows so well, we have this tendency to focus on our failures. Hmm? It's, that, it's that sin, that fallen nature of man. Even when let me meddle just a moment. Even when, even when life is going beautifully for us, somewhere in the back of our minds is that little doubt and fear that, wait, wait a minute here, something bad is surely about to happen. I'm, I'm cruising way too smooth right now. Got to be something that I'm about to run into that's going to mess up my, my good time. And if we're not careful, then we'll in our analytical process, we'll reach back into our history and say, because back when I was doing this back in the day, this bad thing happened to me. And something I'm facing today looks a little bit like the thing that I went through back there. And all of a sudden, our doubts and fears begin to rise up. And we begin to focus on the thought that now I'm going to fail at this. And we fear success. And we fear failing. And Peter and John pull up a seat beside you and me today and say, uh, you, you haven't heard a story till you heard my story. The same John who calls himself the, uh, the disciple that Jesus loved. The same John who with his brother 
wanted to call down thunder and lightning on folk. Same John, that wanted to, his mom came up beside them and said, now when you get to your kingdom, <laughs> that kingdom you're talking about, when you, when you get to that heavenly kingdom, Jesus, can we have a seat on the right end or the left of you? You see, it's something about running to the tomb. It's something about coming, coming to the, having faced, having faced Jesus, having seen Jesus go through the scourgings, the whips, the blood flowing, the lashes on the back, having seen them put the crown of thorns on his head and blood come running down his face, having watched Jesus there, the one they walked with for three years, who they heard powerfully speak this word, heal everybody, all these folk, having seen this same Jesus now carrying the cross on his back and lumbering up that road towards Calvary, having watched this same Jesus being laid down on top of the cross. Can I go here for a moment? And watch the nails, the big long spikes being drilled into his hand and wrist and drilled into his feet and locked, hushed up on that cross with his arms laid out like this, having watched that same Jesus suffer and die for them. Their hearts and minds have been pierced by the reality of the physical death that they witnessed and it was no mirage I'm still on this first lesson but they saw him bring him down off of the cross put him in the tomb pack his body with the spices wrapped up in the traditional Jewish wrappings with about 70 pounds worth of spices intermingled in all the cloth and then they come running to the tomb and look inside. And the first thing that I believe their hearts must have caught on to is everything that we saw looked like failure. But on the third day, Jesus proved that failure is not fatal. Failure is not fatal. And, and, and if he can rise on the third day, then, then certainly all the mess that I've done wrong, all the things I've gotten into, he tells me that can be forgiven, then certainly there's hope for me in the journey. Failure is not fatal. Second thing that, 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 that jumped this, the Holy Spirit, dropped into my spirit was this. Life, when, because Jesus lives, life is not futile. Failure is not fatal, and life is not futile. You got to imagine what it would have been like if they had gone running down to the tomb, and the, reality to, and, and the reality was that someone either stole the body or the body was still there lying lifeless after all that Jesus had said, all that they've seen Jesus do, all of, all of it being hinged on his identity. Yeah, yeah I, am, I am the I am who is the life, the resurrection and the life. I am the I am who is the good shepherd. I am the I am who is the way, the truth, and the life. All of that stuff that you've been telling us, all that we've seen, if indeed all of that is wrapped up in the reality that you given us, the promise you've given us, Jesus, that on the third day you would rise again, and I get down to the tomb, and you haven't risen again, then where is my hope, Paul would say. My, my hope is hopeless, and my life is meaningless. But there's something powerful about the reality, the beauty of what Jesus does uh, uh, when, 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 when he, when he lets us, helps us to understand, if you will. He helps us to understand that our being on this earth, our existence on this earth, uh, God has a purpose for us. And you cannot begin to understand your purpose until you understand your identity. And you cannot begin to understand your identity until you have a relationship with the Creator. And Jesus comes by to tell us that you cannot have a personal relationship with the Creator unless you accept Him as your Lord and Savior. 
There is only one way. There's only one truth. And there's only one life. I heard Ravi Zacharias, Dr. Ravi Zacharias, make this interesting statement when I was watching one of his messages this week. He, he says that the, the, world tends to, the world tends to try to paint Christians as, uh, as uh, narrow-minded and and in and, and, and many, so many cases, they, they want to try to call you and I bigoted because we talk, they have the audacity to say that Jesus says that he is the only way and the only truth and the only life. Like Christianity as a, as a, as a religion, as a faith, is uh, exclusive. <laughs> Dr. Zacharias made this interesting statement. He said, let me tell you, all religions are exclusive. If you go to Islam, they tell you Muhammad's the way. Hinduism, Buddhism, any of those, they say, that this, this, there's only this way. Even the Baha'i folks say, but if you don't believe what we believe, then you, you can't find your way. But none of them, none of them have an answer to your sin problem. They can't get you to the sin problem. They all will tend to be, I'm deviating, but you don't mind me deviating in a moment. They all will focus you, on, focus you in on working your way into some right standing with somebody. And then Jesus comes along and blows all that off the map by making it powerfully plain that you can't earn your way to heaven. You can't work your way to heaven. You can't make yourself righteous. Uh, the, the standard is not 51% right, 49% unrighteous. That doesn't get you in. As a matter of fact, the standard is not even 99.9999999% righteous, as if you could do that. So the unblemished, someone has to pay the price for your sins and for mine. I'm still on here. <laughs> I'm still running to the tomb. And Jesus is the only, only the God who became man can be the unblemished lamb of God and pay the sacrificial price that God has laid down in his standard for the price of sin, which is the blood of a perfect lamb of God. He is the lamb of God. He, he gave himself for that. And so... It gives us meaning. Let me get back to my line. It gives us my, my, my point. It gives us meaning for our living. And when you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, some powerful things begin to happen. I love what Paul says. That he says, you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. You've got a new identity. The old things passed away. All things are, are become and becoming new. In other words, you're now walking in your newness and your who-ness in Christ Jesus. And along with that comes a new purpose. And the new purpose is to first of all glorify the king, glorify God Almighty, and to live and, and, and share that good news to the world out here. In other words, love him with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. And proclaim the good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ and make disciples. The great commandment and the great commission. And it's a part of God's great plan. So life so when, when, when you run to the tomb, as Peter and John did, with your, with your mind all focused in on what you've just seen, what you've just visually seen, that now depresses your heart and begins to dampen your hope. If it hasn't done, it maybe strangled your hope. When you face, let me, let me bring it to your neighborhood. When you face life situations and things seem to be going downhill, maybe it's a health issue, maybe it's a financial issue, maybe it's a family issue, whatever it might be, maybe you're just depressed over life in general and you're, and you're dealing with your situations, you're dealing with your strongholds, you're dealing with your worries, you're dealing with your fears, and, you, and you're wondering, have I fallen short of the Lord so far that his grace isn't sufficient to lift me up? And you think you lose sight of the fact that you haven't stopped living, you're still breathing. God has purpose for your life then you and I need to understand life has meaning, and that meaning can only be understood through Christ Jesus. That's what I wanted to say. I just went a long way around it. And finally, well, 
it's amazing how things pop in your head. I was, I was having that spiritual moment there. Where, uh, <laughs> I was having one of those because he lived moments. I started, my heart started welling up just watching the dancers, hearing the choir, listening to the prayers. And I could almost hear the writer in the background probably dealing with some of the very types of fears and anxieties that John and Peter were dealing with. This was personal. This wasn't, this wasn't, the church, this was me and you, Jesus. And, and, and knowing that we can't solve this by ourselves, maybe the writer's gone through some stuff and, and, and he's being feeling weighted down by that. Y'all don't mind me taking a moment, do you? Uh, maybe, maybe the weight of the world is just, just weighing on his shoulders and, <clears throat> and he's wondering if I can ever get it off and then in the midst of that journey, the Holy Spirit just kind of lifts, comes and reminds him of who he is. Uh, helps to keep in front of him why he is here, why he or she is here. And that the, the God of the universe has placed him, him not, not by coincidence, not by happenstance, but for a purpose. You're here for a purpose. <clears throat> and, and, it, and the writer must have begun to well up. I, I begin to well up as I think about it inside of me because now I, my hope has been en enlarged again be because he lives. I, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. I can face tomorrow. It just begins to hit my heart like that. Because he lives. All fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living. Just because he lives. Mm. 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 So John and Peter run to the tomb. The stone is stone is miraculously removed, they look inside and the, the scriptures tell us that they see the grave clothes depressed. And the wrapping that is around the face <laughs> rolled up and set to the side. I know we may have seen this on TV, but you've got to picture this again. Because Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, does not have to unwrap the wrapping. Think, think about this for a moment. He does not have to unwrap all the wrappings that are around him. They don't find that rolled up in the ball and set to the side. The text indicates that they found, they find uh, the wrapping depressed. <laughs> you got to catch that. It's as if spiritually he just comes out from inside of it. And moves outside of the stone that blocks the sepulcher. And just because we need a little evidence, <laughs> he, moves, he moves the stone out of the way and sets a couple angels on there. 
here's, here's the last thing I want you to take away. Because Jesus lives, not only is failure not fatal, not only is life not futile, but death is not final. Death is not final. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, but right, you know, if I'm with the boys, right about there, my, you know, to the best of my analysis, the best of my logic, to the best of my ability to wrap my arms around this thing and get an understanding of what's happening here, he's just made a profound statement about my future. He says, now, I've covered your past. All your failures of the past are not going to, you're not going to be identified with your failures. My grace is sufficient to cover all the mess, all the circumstances, all the situations you've gotten yourself into, all the things you stumbled into, all the things you ran toward, all the things you thought were good for you that were bad for you. He said, my grace is sufficient to cover all of your past. And he says, my grace is also sufficient to cover your right now. Life has meaning and purpose because of Christ Jesus. Can I preach this thing just a little bit here? I'm going to go home soon. He said, but I'm not finished yet because now I got to take care of your future. I need you to understand that, that this thing is much bigger than you and, 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 and it's way beyond your pay grade, if I can say it that way. Because Jesus lives today, because he rose from the grave and dead, and he lives today, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for you and I every single moment, and gave us this promise that I'm coming back again. I'm coming back again. Because of that, you now have a future, not just a future hope, but matter of fact, the Holy Spirit is the, the Holy Spirit that now lives inside of you is the guarantee, it's the ceiling, it's the, it's the earnest promise, it's, it's the reality inside of you that lets you know that I'm here and I'm powerful and I'm present and I've got your future covered. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. I'm going to prepare a place for you. That's my John 14 moment. That where I am, you shall be also. I've got a mansion up there with your name on it. And when you begin to, when you begin to grasp hold of the Lord, covering your past, covering your present, and covering your future, and you realize that death is not the final word in this thing, it's not, it's not final at all in the midst of this thing, then all of a sudden you can take the weight off of your fear of dying out of your living, and you can live life to the fullest in Christ Jesus. That, that, that's, that's what the message is. Don't come, he says to John, he basically says to John and Peter and his rising again, don't come running down here to the tomb with all of that weight on your shoulders. Don't come down here to the tomb worried and fearful. Don't come down here with all weighted down thinking that you're, what, you're making a death march toward the tomb. You need to come on in God's house. You need to run towards this tomb shouting. You need to come on down here with your hands raised up, son. Come on down here excited and exhilarated about what God is doing because God's in the resurrection business. He already showed you when he raised Lazarus from the dead that he's got the power over death and the power of life. He says, so don't come down here hopeless. Because death is not the final word. I love, I love the way, I, give me my, my 1 Corinthians 15 moment if you don't want. I just grabbed a few of these verses out of 51. The, the, the King James, is, is, is the wording is so much prettier than the Amplified, but let me, let me, let me give you my 51. This is, this is hooping territory for preachers. Let, let, let me put it to you like that. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, brother preacher. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm not finished, the preacher said. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and, and the dead in Christ shall rise, and shall raise incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Pause that right there. Stick a pen right there. That same Jesus that John and Peter look into the tomb, and they see the grave clothes suppressed. We shall be changed. That, that, that same Jesus that, that walked through the walls, you know, and was able to transport and be in different places and yet still eat a little fish with the boys, we, we, we shall be changed. That, that incorruptible body, well, I'm here. So when this incorruptible, 
<laughs> must put on incorruption. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Okay, keep, keep on flipping. I'm not finished preaching. So when the corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be, then shall be brought to pass the saying which is written. Come on, preach it like you own it. Come on, preach it like you I hear you over there. Come on, preach that thing like death is swallowed up in victory. Swallowed. Death isn't final. Death is swallowed up in victory. And then Paul, and then Paul wasn't finished preaching. He still had a little hoop left. He says, oh, death. Oh, death, oh, death. <laughs> don't make me tune, don't make me tune. <laughs> oh, death, oh, death, where, where, where? Where, preacher, where death is your sting? Where? Tell me about it somewhere. Where is that sting, death, that you've been, you've been making me fearful about all my days? Where is that sting you've been burdening me down with? Where is it? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Mm. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But I'm not finished preaching right there. But he said, but thanks. <laughs> but thanks be to God. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Take me home with that last verse, or I'll be here all day. Therefore, I'm giving you the theology. Let me give you the therefore. Life lesson time. Therefore, my brethren, be ye steadfast. Failure is not fatal. Life is not futile. And death is not final. Therefore, my, brother, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Anybody in the house? In anybody in the house today? Come on, are you in the house today? I'm talking to you, brethren. Be steadfast. Are you in the house today? Be unmovable. I'm still talking to you in the house today. Always abounding. Always abounding. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For he says, your labor is not in vain. He walks out of the tomb and steps right into your heart and says, be steadfast. What are we going to do with that? family. He's given us a new identity. He's given us a new purpose. He's given us a new plan. And then he's undergirded it by reminding us through the resurrection that I am the I am. Because he is the uncreated. I mean, Jesus, birth and the like, but because he is who he is, We can do, Paul would go on to them and say, I can do all things through Christ Jesus. All things. Matter of fact, that verse is right underneath this carpet right here. Right on that floor when we wrote our verses on the floor. All things. So let's get, let's get, I, I want to pray, but let, let's, let's get our focus to where God would have it. If it needs a resetting, let God do the resetting. And watch him pour into you, bless out through you, and have impact that you could never imagine that we mere mortals could have as we stand for Jesus. Failure is not fatal. Life is not futile. And death is not final. Father God, thank you for our time you've given us, for the blessing you provided us, for the family you've put together. Continue to pour your, your spirit and your, and your power and your love, your grace and your mercy in and through us as it flows out. Help us to flow it out to the world.
and sharing this good news of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We want to be steadfast. We want to be unmovable, Lord. We want to always be abounding in the grace and mercy and love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. We give you thanks. Let all God's people in the house say just a gigantic amen to the Lord. Amen. Praise God. As we stand together, we're going to open up the doors of the church. We never like to leave the house of the Lord without opening up our arms and extending the invitation if you're here. Next Sunday just is on our schedule as a baptismal Sunday. And if you have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, this is the first invitation to you. We want to invite you to come and make that public statement of faith and let public step of faith and let us welcome you as family. And we will put you in the pool next Sunday as we bless. My grandson's coming, has come down and we're blessed with that. I know we got a little one coming this way. Secondly, if you already know Jesus as Lord and Savior, but you're without a church home or you're in transition, we want to invite you to come and become a part of the Trinity family. Our doors are open, our arms are extended to you, and we'd love to invite you to take that step today with family here. It's a simple process. We don't vote you in, don't vote you out. We just welcome you home. So if the Lord's moving on your heart, would you take a step either way on that and let us welcome you to the family, the doors of the church. The Lord is speaking with you. Because I know who holds the future. Oh, praise God. Come on down, family. Come on down, family. Welcome home, daughter. The Lord is speaking to your heart. Won't you take that step of faith today? We'd love to welcome you. Welcome you home. taking the information down. We'd love to have you come down and join us if the Lord is moving on your heart. There's no better day than right now. No better place than right here to begin this fresh new journey. Blessing and service in the Lord. day to welcome Angelique Anderson and her daughter Taylor Fulton and they are they are coming with Christian experience welcome thank you you are so welcome thank you. I had, to, I had to step off for a second. Now, praise God. Thank you, Tom. Excuse me. Let me give my hug. Because I, I, I stepped off, and I always like to give my hug for you. I want to make sure baby girl got a chance to come down, because she's coming down to be baptized next Sunday. I didn't, want, I didn't want to leave. I was looking for her. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. 
Yeah, let them see who you are. I was looking for you, baby. That's we, all. We, we cannot leave out Aaliyah Lumpkins. Come she, in there. Come on up here with me, sweetie. <laughs> she is one of four children being baptized next Sunday. Amen. That is so exciting. Where, where Do we have our bapt some of our baptismal candidates here? Could you stand? Well, yeah, come, come, come on. Jonah Let us see you real quick. Marcus. We got some young folk and we got some. Yes. A couple of our adults are not, may not be here today. Praise God. We just want to say thank you and praise God for you coming down. Where's the little man? Come on to you, man. Yeah. Okay. Amen. Okay. Amen. Come on down, Lord. This, this, is, this is Jonah. Angel Marcus. Oh, here's Evan. Come on, honey. Amen. <laughs> okay. Now, now we have we have all four of our babies that are being baptized next Sunday. Hold him. Hold him. Okay. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Might have to say that again. I'm not sure what to do. Amen. Let's give them a hand clap of praise. We got an adult faction here that's coming down. This we're thankful. Praise God. Now, before you leave, make sure you get a chance to shake some hands with our family members who will come, but take your neighbor by the hand as we prepare to close. It's always good to see friends and family being with us on this beautiful day. Next Sunday is baptismal Sunday. It's going to be a joyous, joyous occasion. not fatal. Life is not futile. And death is not final. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed and our hearts humbled before the living God, assuming an attitude of prayer, lifting our hands to him in praise. Now unto him who is able to keep you and me from falling and present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, now, henceforth, and forevermore. Let all God's people say amen. Next Sunday morning. Don't rush off. Have some fellowship time. 